<laughs> I don't know. I I think you have to say something about the fact that I'm pretty awesome and uh, a state park masturbator in the same sense. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Silence, please. Three, three, two. Well, welcome to On Gravel. This is Andrew McKean. I'm here with Eric Dinger and Ryan Bronson. Gents, what's going on this week? I'm selling a house, so that's what's going on. I'm in the heart of my favorite time of year. We got pheasant hunts on the back end and front end of this podcast. I'm excited. I'm sleepy. We, uh, I think something about transitional housing is the theme of this podcast Bronson, I am building a house. We just moved in last night. Spent the first night in a new house. It's been two years in the construction, and it's still not done. See, it's good that you bring up that it's been two years in the construction, because someone who listens to our podcast religiously, like Don Dinger, might think that we're making so much money from this podcast that we can afford (laughs) real estate. And that would not be the case. (laughs) That would would not be the case. Although two out of the three of us are pending new homes, so... Maybe it is the case. Maybe podcasting was the secret all along. Oh, it's lucrative. Yeah, I just needed to take what spare time I had in my life and dedicate it to recording conversations with you guys every week, and that just made my productivity soar. Next thing you know, (laughs) Bronson's got a new house. (laughs) Andrew, what are we talking about this week? We are going to talk about a couple of things. We actually had I had an interesting day in between trips with uh, my buddies moving my all way too many contents uh, to my new house, too much gear. Uh, we had our first mentored uh, range day and gun safety session. In a previous podcast, we talked about this kind of mentor experiment, countywide mentoring experiment we're doing this fall. So this was the first kind of meet and greet we had. It was interesting. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about how every moving party needs what I call moving juice, which is also known as Old Milwaukee Light. Uh, And then I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, other hometowns, yours, and pheasant hunting. We're going to talk a little rough grouse society hunting, and I don't know, then we'll bring it right back to how much gear I have. So you mentioned that you and your buddy is moving, so you're a grown-ass man. You're not a 20-something, you know, fresh (laughs) out of college. You're telling me that you didn't have to hire a moving company, You that you got your buddies to help you move? I am telling you that despite the fact that most of these buddies moved a piano into my the house that I just left nine years ago, they came back for more. Uh, yep, we had 12 or 13 pickups all in a convoy. One of my buddies said if we had all turned our headlights on, we would have looked like a funeral possession. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, but we were all kind of pallbearers, mostly pallbearers of my freezers. Uh, yeah, it was cool. It's like small towny. Everybody showed up. Nothing. Actually, we we lost one picture. Uh, the the pain of a glass of one picture, but that's kind of all that got broken. I think. So you're telling me you got twelve pickup loads worth of humans to show up for Old Milwaukee Light? Yep. <laughs> yep. Wow. And here's what, actually, this is the biggest sort of calculus or, or I guess, um, indi- indication that I am getting to be an old fart is we still had beer left over. Wow. I have drastically underestimated that beer. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, was, I, can, hey, I, I can tell you the last time I drank old Milwaukee. It was 2002 and it was at the Ottertail County Fair. And the reason I drank it then is because it was all that was on tap. And I have not had it since. So I'm, I'm, I'm tipping my hat to you and saying I am impressed. Here's impressed. the – actually, this is interesting. I got some Michelob Ultra because, you know, it's a bunch of men of a certain age. Uh, that was not consumed. I got PBR because I like it. That was not consumed. But the Old Milwaukee – and it's important to note it was not Old Milwaukee regular. This was Old Milwaukee Light was gone. Wow. So, so, Dinger, do you think you got 12 buddies that have pickup trucks? Never mind whether you could get them to help you move. Do you think you've got 12 that have pickups? Oh, God. You know, I think I would have to go to, like, 
friends of friends, and I know it would have to be a lot better alcohol than than old Milwaukee <laughs> Light. <laughs> oh, I probably have twelve, but not much more than that. And to think that all of them would show up on the same day is a decidedly small town awesomeness. Is that? Andrew, are you just that great of a guy that you have 12 moving day friends? Or is this like a small town thing that, that we need to get back to? How do you, a day later, how do you assess this phenomenon? No, I'm a horrible person. I'm a taker, not a giver. I don't understand why people would do this. I think it's my wife. She is a, she's angelic. But um, for whatever reason, there they were. And it was it was a wide variety of friends and buddies. So there were, uh, my twins are seniors in high school with some of their buddies. And the parents of my f- boys' friends, who are also my friends, but then it was just random folks. That, but we're all friends. We're all beer drinking buddies. Um, I'm pretty awesome, it turns out. But here's the thing: <laughs> I, pro- I promised everybody that we'd go bird hunting afterward, and nobody really wanted to, mostly because they were so sore. So the promise of a hunt could have helped, but. It could have, but it didn't have to, and it didn't need to. We got the work anyway. So I think I do own bird hunts, though, in uh, the near future. Huh. I think if I promise people a bird hunt, I think I could get 12. But the, if you think about it, you're going to get 12 people to show up on moving day that own trucks, you need 50 moving day friends to be able to coordinate a single day where they could all sh- where 12 could show up. Don't you? Well, see, this was the magic of the whole deal. I mentioned earlier that I uh, we had this range day yesterday, so I was pretty committed to that. So I told everybody to show up between one and two, hoping I'd be back uh, from the range by then. Well, you know how that goes at the range; it's, nothing really works out. Time drags on at the range, especially these were some beginning shooters, and it took a little bit of time with them. I was desperate; I was going to be late for my own moving party. I got there; everybody already had the pickups loaded. Oh my God! Yeah, you're a genius. Yeah, right. Of course, I, I told where them I'd been at the bar the whole time. Where'd you get boxes? I'm curious where you get boxes in Glasgow. Uh, <laughs> Glasgow, dinger. It's not that funny. You're just you're encouraging him. Uh, my neighbor, my neighbor works uh, at the butcher shop. And uh, there's no shortage of boxes where they get uh, they get fat to mix with sausage. So we had we had fat boxes. Fat boxes. Huh. I had a I had a celebratory beer this weekend. If I if I tell you the uh, tagline, you think you'll be able to get it? The born in the land of sky blue waters. Waters. Hams, hams the beer, beer refreshing. refreshing. Hams the hams beer, beer refreshing. refreshing. Hams. Uh, so we uh, we got done hunting uh, in the governor's hunt, and our host handed us a uh, a beer that he said it was a goddamn privilege to be able to have this beer in the field. And I honestly didn't know what he was going to hand me. And uh, he said, it's a hams. <laughs> I started laughing because the only time I've ever drank hams was in college when it was like the only beer you could afford because it was like, you know, with your buyer's commission, it was like 15 bucks for a 30 pack. He was right. It was damn good for the first, you know, until it warmed up above 34 degrees, then it started tasting a little hammy. But is that called a macro brew? Ooh, a meta brew? <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe brought me back to a different life. Well, I, I'm, I hate to break it to you, Eric, but hams is not brewed in Minnesota anymore. It's brewed in Wisconsin. Miller makes it now, don't they? I think G Heileman and down in Lacrosse. I think that's where the brewery is. I mean, the Hams Brewery used to be in, I think, St. Paul. It's I mean, in Milwaukee it's, now. I we read the back of the can yesterday. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I, I, I have not stayed up on my beer. Uh, business, uh, you know, ever since the South Africans bought the big beer company, it's just America has been going to hell ever since. So when he handed me this beer and I chuckled, um, he, you know, he kind of knowingly looked back at me and he he said one of the great compulsory things I've ever heard when asking of someone to drink a beer. He said, "Do it for your country." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I don't know. If somebody says it that way, how do you ever say no? Apparently, that's why I went to college instead of joining the military. I was drinking for my country. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dinger, take us home. You uh, you had an interesting weekend. You went back to Laverne, Minnesota. What was going on? Yeah, I went back to Laverne, Minnesota. My uh, my hometown in the southwest corner of the state uh, hosted the governor's hunt. And uh, being from South Dakota originally and then uh, graduating from high school in Minnesota, the governor's hunt in South Dakota is a great big deal. You know, Chevy sends and makes a governor's hunt edition truck. And it's just a... a big honor to be invited to so when i was invited uh to laverne to do the minnesota governor's hunt i was kind of on cloud nine because i felt like maybe i'd made it on somebody's radar you know maybe this podcast had reached the governor's office and it was a really really cool event um but the governor wasn't at the governor's hunt which was a little odd um so it was the um one of the people running for governor's hunt (laughs) because i think uh is that Representative Walls was there, and he's running for governor. And I think he was the only uh, politician, I guess, running for office that was there. So, uh, But I wasn't going to hunt with the governor anyways, and we had a hell of a good time. And, you know, we've been talking a little bit about small towns. One of the neat things is Laverne is a town of about 4,500 people. Um, just the community buy-in for something like the governor's hunt was fantastic. So we rolled into town on Friday morning. Uh, or Friday mid-afternoon, I guess. And all the stores were decorated in orange, and everybody had Welcome Hunters banners, and the bars were, you know, the signs said Hunter's Special and Welcome Governor's Hunt. And, uh, you know, that's all really cool and maybe something you'd expect from a small town. But then the banquet happened that night, and 450 people from Laverne came to the banquet. And that was by far the biggest governor's hunt banquet they'd ever had. Um, but I think it's just, it goes back to that, that thing you're saying, Andrew, where you had 12 guys show up to move you. That kind of thing is still alive and well in our culture in, in that there are places where community comes first. And this was a big event to, to the community of Laverne and people showed up. I mean, the businesses sponsored it, the, the local committee was made up of people who, who care about hunting and care about, uh, about the region. And it was just a really neat honor to be a part of it, A, and then B, to have it in, in your hometown. My dad and brother were hunter hosts and things. And so we had a hell of a good time. Um, and, and the hunt itself was uh, in a bunch of areas. They had uh, 25 groups, I think, of somewhere between four and five hunters. Uh, and so we actually got to hunt uh, a property that I had known of for a long time, uh, but we'd never gotten to hunt before. And so it was neat. I got to see some parts of the county uh, I went to high school in that I'd never seen before. And it was an absolutely gorgeous 50-degree day for a pheasant hunt. My wife hunted with us. Uh, we just had an awesome time. The kids all came. And it was really, really cool. So, Eric, I saw you posted a picture on Instagram where you guys were posed by a little creek with a waterfall. Was that the the Prairie Fire Waterfall Production Area? Uh, no, it wasn't. It was uh, That's the uh, Tallgrass Prairie. It's uh, a federal refuge, actually, that's open to bird hunting. Um, an ac- absolutely incredible property. It's maybe two or three sections of ground in, in Laverne, um, which is or ne- north of Laverne, which is – uh, not unlike a lot of heavily ag production areas, it's almost all privately owned, uh, with the exception of this and a couple of walk-in areas in the county. The land is worth, um, I mean, I, a couple of years ago, uh, a hog confinement operation bought a parcel of ground for $21,000 an acre. And we're talking farm ground. Ooh. So it's pretty tough to incentivize walk-in programs in an area where the land's worth that much. I mean, the ag is taken very, very seriously in the area. And so, uh, yeah, I was in uh, the Tallgrass Prairie, and and that is an incredible place. It's surrounded by ag. Uh, All of the crops were still in, so the hunting was a little tougher than it is sometimes. But, you know, when you go with a local, uh, my dad being the local, he kind of knows how the property works. And so we timed up a hunt just right and actually – in our family hunt that evening, uh, we ended up having a pretty great hunt. Uh, but the but the governor's hunt itself with 121 hunters 
hunted all morning Saturday morning and shot 25 total pheasants in the county. So uh, if that tells you anything about uh, the difference between hunting in southwest Minnesota and where I grew up, where uh, on opener in near Redfield, South Dakota, if you don't shoot 25 birds with your group uh, within an hour or two of, of the start of the season, you're doing something wrong. So it's just different. Um, but it was really cool. I mean, uh, it was an honor to be a part of it, first of all, and, and it was really fun to to have my family involved in it. I will tell you, Mr. Bronson, that federal premium ammunition was a major part of this governor's hunt, at least from my perspective. We, we were supporting our Minnesota brothers while we were there. Well, I appreciate, well, I appreciate that. that. So what did you, what did you guys do? Well, have you guys ever done a governor's hunt? Yeah, I've, uh, I've done both the Minnesota governor's hunt a f several years when we sponsored it. Um, and then we sponsor the South Dakota governor's hunt every year. I'll be out there in a week. So that's usually the second week of the non-resident season uh, out in South Dakota. And uh, like you said, it's, that is a really big, fun event. Um, I've never been out there and not shot a limit of birds at that event. Uh, you, you get on some pretty cool ground where local landowners, uh, you know, invite you out for a day and you get to do that. And, and, and so I'm looking forward to that event coming up here in a couple of weeks. Um, and I've also hunted in the pheasant, uh, governor's pheasant event, the ringneck classic in Kansas. And that's a little bit more like a Minnesota event. The South Dakota event is really about trying to attract people to South Dakota and say, this is why you should come to South Dakota and do business and look how great our hunting is. So it's kind of the hunting is kind of secondary to the overall message. Whereas in Minnesota and in, in Kansas, the message is both communicating the hunting heritage, but also encouraging people to visit these rural places. The, the Kansas hunts way out in Western Kansas where you know, you, if you stand up on a fence post, you can see Denver um, out there. It's 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 way out west, but uh, really cool event. I love all those events. Um, you know, I'm glad that you were repping uh, the federal ammo. Uh, I know uh, the, the governor's office was not uh, here in Minnesota, and I think it, I don't think they're tracking uh, this podcast because if they were tracking it and they knew that you were part of this podcast affiliated with me i think they probably wouldn't have invited you Eric. <laughs> probably so but you'll get a new governor next year the way it sounds and i imagine you'll be back in there i think there's a very good possibility that that's true <laughs> <laughs> so uh, not to dominate the conversation here but there was a couple of really neat things that happened this weekend that uh number one you know when when your small town steps up like that it gives you a sense of of home and of place and it makes you happy and i can imagine andrew your boys coming back in a couple of years after they're off to college when something big is going on in glasgow and it it really fills your bucket to know that your little town um not unlike uh, well unlike some small towns you know laverne is thriving and the businesses are doing well and it just makes me happy to think that my family is a part of something good like that um, but what I want to tell you guys about is the the hunt that evening, uh, the, the governor's hunt lasted until maybe two or three. There was a shooting exhibition and a lunch and stuff like that. But then uh, we did our family hunt. Uh, well, just a hunt, I guess, in my family. Um, but what was really cool this time was uh, almost everybody in my family went. The girls are all shooting now. Um, and then little Reagan, my seven-year-old, came along. And we're walking through the tall grass prairie. And this is a no-joke pheasant walk. I mean, the, there's been enough rain to where the grass is thick and pretty tall. And it's a mile across and a couple miles wide. And so it was kind of a binary thing. She had to walk a mile there and back or she wasn't going to be able to go. And you talk about, like, one of my favorite hunting experiences in a long time. So I look to my left and my dad and two brothers and my brother's wives are that direction. And, and, uh, that was really neat. And then Reagan's kind of tagging along right with me walking behind me. Cause I was matting down the grass and, or holding my hand so she didn't fall as she was walking. And I look off to the right and our buddies from, uh, from, uh, Marna carnivore hunted with us. And, uh, there was three of those guys, uh, backcountry hunters and anglers guys, modern carnivore. And then the, the, Lucas, the gentleman that runs the Minnesotans for the Boundary Waters organization, hunted with us. And all of this is to say, you know, we're, we're having this beautiful hunt in a, 
in a great public land place with my family, uh, with my daughters tagging along. She's, you know, we're talking, we're kicking all the milkweeds and she's throwing them up in the air and, and she's learning about seed distribution and we're chatting away. And we get done with the hunt and uh, Mark with Modern Carnivore gave my family an incredible compliment. He said that it was just so cool to be involved with a family that thinks about hunting the way we do. And I was kind of taken aback and he said, you know, this was your dad's hunt. This is, you know, your dad set this up, but you didn't think twice about inviting us the day of the hunt. And then when your dad found out about it, he didn't bat an eye. He was just like, yeah, of course. And what was cool about that, it was, it it brought to light the, the culture in my family as it relates to hunting is in a culture of, of invitation. Um, and, and as Mark and I were talking about it, sometimes we, we in the, in the hunting industry talk about tribe, tribes, tribalism, you know, Sitka is really famous for having built the, the Sitka tribe. And we, we got a little deep on this topic and we can sure, certainly talk about it another time. But the, the way my family thinks about hunting is that hunting is inclusive of whoever wants to go. And for that reason, my dad's probably taught north of a hundred people to hunt in his life. And, and so we laughingly said that the difference between tribe and community, which is the way our family thinks about hunting, is an invite. And me inviting those people being a norm in the community approach to hunting that my family has is what uh, Mark thought was so cool. So it was really rewarding to, to have others see that, you know, others that work in the outdoor industry. Um, we had a nice hunt. We shot, I don't know, five or six birds. It wasn't like we were lighting it up, but uh, it was just really rewarding for, for others to see that you know, at least for our little family, hunting is a very social thing and a very inclusive thing of whoever's around and whoever wants to go hops in the truck and we go. That's pretty cool. Hey, and Modern Carnivore has got his own part podcast. I, he recently interviewed recently. Howard Vincent from Pheasants Forever. And, you know, that if you want to learn about Pheasants Forever, you can check out that podcast because it's pretty educational. Look at me cross-promoting other podcasts. There you go, yeah. Yeah, well, we, we got into uh, – at about 1 a.m., we were pretty heavily into the uh, bourbons, let's say, and uh, we went full podcast conversation. We we covered, we scorched the earth with some of the broad topics we got into, and that's pretty fun. And, and we got done, and, and Lucas, one of the guys that was along, said, you know, we should have just recorded this and called it a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Although the slurring and swearing probably wouldn't have been a good addition to any anything anybody would want to listen to. All right, so our episode eight that just came out, my wife asked me if I'd been drinking because she thought I slurred <laughs> a couple times. And the fact of the matter was we recorded that in the middle of the day, and I was at uh, the office. So I could guarantee her that I had not been drinking. I don't know why I was slurring. Maybe I was having an aneurysm that day. Hope not. An andrewism? What's that? <laughs> well bronson you were hunting with the rough grouse society is that right i was the uh the rough and grouse society holds a national they call it the national hunt every year it's it's based in grand rapids minnesota which is a town i lived in for a couple of years when i worked for the minnesota deer hunters association so it's old stomping grounds for me little different event it's a it's a it's a fundraiser for rough grouse society so you have to be a sponsor of of pheasants forever to participate and there's a waiting list and and things but you you get invited in you can bring your dogs or you can you can get paired with a local huntsman who provides the dogs and everyone gets assigned an area and it's almost all public land uh there's a little bit of private land where folks are, are running or, or corporate timber land. The big timber companies in Minnesota, most of them have their land open for public hunting. And so they've been doing it for 36 years. This was the 36th annual. And every year, every bird that gets shot gets uh, brought in. And the biologists at Rough Grouse Society age and sex the birds. And so they've been keeping data uh, since the beginning of time on woodcock and grouse and so it's it's usually a good indicator uh relative to the to the population and grouse have that every 10 year you know boom and bust cycle that uh, no one 
has been able to fully explain. A uh, few researchers over the years have tried, but you know we don't completely understand what causes that yet. Um, but I think that gives biologists something to keep looking for. So I was there. I was supposed to hunt for two days, and I had invited a friend of mine uh, from Kansas who had never killed a woodcock up because he really wanted to get a woodcock. And the day before the hunt, uh, overnight, we got six inches of snow up north of Grand Rapids where we were hunting. So everyone in the hunting area had between three and six inches of snow. And I was scared to death that there wasn't going to be any woodcock. Uh, and it was going to drive them out of, the, out of the state. And what it actually did is we, we found that there was kind of a flight that came in and there were a lot of woodcock. Unfortunately, my buddy... Uh, had gotten sick while he was driving in. He just had a little stomach issues. He had full-fledged it, norovirus or the flu. I don't know what it was, but he was down and out for two full days. And so he wasn't able to hunt with me on the first day of the hunt because he was just completely out. Uh, couldn't couldn't get more than 10 feet away from the bathroom. And so I had this moment of, what do I do? I mean, here's this guy. He's hundreds of miles away from his house. He's in a hotel room in the middle of nowhere, and I had to decide if I was going to not go out hunting or if I was going to stay and, and, you know, help take care of him for the day. Hold his hair back. And uh, I did what a hunting buddy would do. I went and bought him two. You went hunting. <laughs> I went and bought two bottles of Gatorade, some Imodium AD, and some Theraflu, and I dropped it off with him, and I went hunting. So... <laughs> That's 30 bucks we'd all spend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I, and I kept thinking I should feel guilty about this, right? But I didn't. And I asked him, you know, th- that night when we got back, I said, it's okay that I went hunting today. He says, yeah, I, I would have done it to you too. So that's how I know that we're, we're, we're officially hunting buddies, that we would have both abandoned each other to go hunting by ourselves. <laughs> But hunting was not great. It was it was it was okay. Um, you know our grouse population isn't as high as it should be. Um, you, you know, and, the, and they were they were doing West Nile um, testing and things. And uh, I ended up not even hunting the second day because I had to help him, you know, get back on the road the next day. So I only hunted one day. But I got to tell you, the guy I hunted with, uh, the, the huntsman, he's a professional guide. His name's Pat Flanagan. And he's originally from Minnesota, and he has started a business called Border to Border Outfitters. He's got a stable of 14 dogs, and he starts out the season in September up here in on the border of Canada. He's got a hunting camp up there uh, for grouse and woodcock, and he hunts you know, the first, first part of the season here, and then he goes down to Kansas, and he hunts quail and and. and in grouse down in Kansas. And then he finishes the season in January and February hunting down in Arizona, you know, within a stone's throw of the Mexican border. And then he takes, you know, a few, some, a little bit of time at the end of winter off in the summer training dogs. And then he starts it over. He's been doing it for several years. Fascinating story. Great hunter, uh, great dogs. Um, You know, he just, just a cool story. It was, it, I'm, I'm always uncomfortable when I'm hunting with a guide, you know, I'm, I'm a do it yourself or just grew up doing it that way. But, uh, he wasn't carrying a gun cause the rules of the, of the hunt said that he couldn't, but you know, it just felt like I was hunting with a buddy that had really, really, really good dogs. It was pretty cool. So I'm my, th- this week's, uh, episode of on gravel is brought to you by border to border outfitters. <laughs> go, go and book you a hunt. Were you tempted at all to bring your dog? Uh, I was not tempted even a little bit to bring my dog um, for a couple reasons. First, I, you know, I've got labs, and I have killed plenty of grouse and woodcock over labs. Um, but Soka is young, and uh, she doesn't know what she's doing yet with a lot of things, and so that would have been a problem. And, and really, the whole reason I was going to the hunt this year was to get Chris his woodcock, and I really wanted it. To be over a pointer, woodcock are great. They usually hold real steady for a pointer. You know, when you're hunting the grouse woods up north here, part of it is finding the birds, and then part of it is getting yourself into a position where you can actually get a shot off. 
And so I didn't end up killing any birds. I shot at three grouse and I, and I uh, uh, shot at one woodcock. And I killed a number of aspen trees, but did not kill a bird all day. Uh, just because, you know, that's the nature of grouse hunting in the heavy woods. You, you know, you end up shooting a lot of trees because it's, it's thick, thick as heck. But it was uh, interesting conditions. We were soaked from the beginning because, you know, we'd gotten six inches of snow the night before. And there was, it, it had been raining all the way up to that until it got cold enough to turn into snow. So all of the snow was stuck on that dog hair, uh, popple, uh, aspen, and then, you know, everything. So every step I took, I was banging a little sapling tree and it was knocking all of the snow on me. And so I was constantly wiping off my barrel so that it was, you know, I could see the bead and, and, you know, I was just, you just accepted the fact you're going to be soaked all day, but it was a great great day in the woods i i had a blast saw saw some birds we the, the very first point of the day uh his dog was pointing a dead woodcock that had been killed by a hawk and we we flushed the hawk when we were coming in and it flew away and then the dog locks up on point and we get there and then we find the carcass what was left of 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 a woodcock so that you know bird probably migrated in from canada the night before and First thing that morning in its new little haunt, uh, you know, it got killed by a hawk. But that was that was pretty cool. Did not see any wolf sign, but um, the the forests that are being properly managed up in northern Minnesota through forestry are, are very healthy. It was it was a lot of fun. Have you guys ever hunted well, grouse, rough grouse? I have, yeah. Uh, both with a dog and without a dog, and I will tell you, it's much uh, more effective with a dog. Yeah. I've never hunted grouse, but I was elk hunting in Colorado uh, two falls ago, and you guys probably know where this is going, but the single most startling thing I think I've ever had happen in nature was I was walking through some really deep cover, and I busted a blue grouse from about eight feet in front of me, and I... I don't know that I crapped my pants, but it's it had to have been close. It was. You guys ever had that happen? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh my god, this scared the crap out of me. I mean, <laughs> never with a blue grouse for me, but plenty of times with rough grouse. When I was a kid, I I grew up in North Missouri. Uh, in the age, this will date me a little bit. There were pretty healthy wild quail populations, and uh, we had a little four hundred acre farm with pretty good secondary, you know, kind of cover. A lot of buck brush and stuff and, and pretty good quail populations <laughs> i had my first horse was this little 60 dollar uh rescue horse named scout and the reason he was uh put up for adoption or for sale i guess was he was just a trip wire of a little pony i was about eight or nine and um for the first couple of years until i kind of figured out how to manage it i would ride uh, to gather cows or go check on him with my dad, who's a pretty good horseman, and, sc- and I was not. I a scout would routinely bust coveys of quail and just go berserk and buck me off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as I thought, think back on it, actually, he didn't really buck me off as much as he would just run and then stop suddenly, and I would just go hurtling over his head. Uh, can you hear the train coming through? Mm-mm. Oh, maybe the headphones I'm using are obscuring it, but the train sounds like it's coming right through my office. So are we at a one train podcast right now? We're at a one trainer. This is uh we better hurry unless uh, you know, lest we turn this into a two train podcast. But I think, I think a train and a half is kind of our sweet spot. <laughs> I think so too. So uh, speaking of sweet spots, I've been really loath to bring this up, but uh I, I don't see that we have an alternative, and that is Dinger's um, flirtation with his masculine side, uh, he experimented a little bit, not with um, by curiosity, but rather <laughs> mustache and facial hair. Uh, um, and I, I guess I'm having a hard time finding words because I was having a hard time finding words because uh, I was retching in my throat as I saw the early pictures. How did it turn out that must 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 mustache? Yeah. <laughs> what is there like a pre mustache? Is there a term for that? Yeah, I think it's called puberty. 
Oh, oh, okay. Well, uh, I don't even know where to start, but I'll tell you where it ends. I, I grew what looked like, you know, like if you see if you see a squirrel that got hit on the way to work like three weeks ago, and then three weeks later you see it and it's like been run over 47 times, but there's a little hair here and there. Now imagine shading that and taping it to a man's face, and you're getting pretty close to what my mustache-like object looked like. The, the plus side of a mustache is people take you much more seriously um, from a distance. Um, you get a lot of genuflecting and a lot of curtsying out of the ladies and things like that, all natural things for a man of, of fine facial hair. Uh, the downside is your wife won't kiss you or at least won't kiss me. Um, and so I was at this tipping point where it had started to look a little bit like a mustache, but I had not kissed my wife in the way longer than it should take to grow a mustache f period of time. And uh, <laughs> I got to Minnesota and my, my stepmom says, just you're not going out with me and my friends tonight with that on your face. Like that is disgusting. And so I posted it on Facebook, and pretty much everybody with no stake in my wife ever kissing me again said it was a great thing, and anybody that was a fan and cheered for my marriage said that you needed to, to cut it and bury it and never let it happen again. And so I shaved it. It's gone. Um, it was a great run. It was a beautiful thing. Question? I did not make any flies out of it and mail them to anyone. <laughs> well, so we have to dispense with the question first, and then we'll get to that. Did you only grow the mustache, or did you let all of your facial hair grow and then shave off a bunch of it and left the mustache? Did you, uh, in the process, did you see what you might have looked like with a goatee, for instance? Well, uh, I'm of Scandinavian origin. And so Beards and I are never going to be on the same page. Um, so I left it only as a mustache and routinely shaved the balance of whatever other facial hair might sprout out one direction or another. So, no, it was a purebred mustache from start to finish. Did you film any porn at any time while you had the mustache on? <laughs> no, but, but the mustache actually had a purpose because – Ironically, when my stepmom and dad got married, my dad had a glorious mustache. But my dad's really <clears throat> dark complected and can grow a great mustache. And so he turned 60 here in a couple of days. And so we were going to grow, my brothers and I all were going to grow mustaches for my dad's 60th birthday because that is what he used to have. And, and uh, lo and behold, the woman that was once attracted to a mustache enough to marry a man with one uh, was a turncoat and thought that. A, a person shouldn't be allowed to have a mustache. So, no, it was a, a mustache of full intention. Uh, the funniest comment I got a lot of the people, people mustaches will bring out the crowd. That's for sure. And the funniest one was uh, the bookkeeper uh, and I were meeting here at Powderhook. She's a gal that's worked for, uh, for me for man, I don't know, eleven years or twelve years or something since long before uh, we had this business. And so we're pretty close and. Uh, <laughs> she walks in and she said, what in the hell is on your face? <laughs> and I laughed and I said, it's part of my Halloween costume. And she said, just without skipping the beat, she goes, what are you going to do for Halloween? A child molester? <laughs> so, my take was, so she's not, it didn't look intentional enough to be child molestation. It was more like a state park masturbator mustache. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, well, that, God. In, in your defense, Eric, that's a step up from a county park masturbator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And step down from national parks. And, uh, oh, jeez. Hey, uh, this, this conversation reminds me of a great, great story. Uh, have you guys ever heard uh, the, of the cheapest kind of meat of all? No, what's the cheapest kind of meat of all? Uh, it's deer balls. They're under a buck. Huh. Mm -hmm. What's the proper length of quiet that you should do for a joke that has died? 
I think we achieved it. In fact, that was an impressive, <laughs> impressive, grievous period. And we were grieving for you, Dinger, not for the death of the joke, but really for Jeez. reputation. Could you imagine if I told that joke and had that mustache? <laughs> that might have been the end of my podcasting career. No, but who would end your podcasting career? The, the government doesn't regulate podcasts, so I think we'd be okay. Now, my corporate lawyers may tell me that I can no longer be affiliated with the podcast and I'd have to quit, but I don't think there's anyone that can come in and shut you down because, you know, America. Mm-hmm. Hams. This is why we drink hams. <laughs> oh, imagine drinking a hams, saying that joke, and having that mustache. Oh, that's, that's National Park Masturbator level right there. What, what kind of hat are you wearing? uh man that's a good question it's probably it's probably some sort of one of those stocking caps that that you pull way back on your head so you're like ultra hipster oh yeah just to throw the whole scenario off a yeah. little bit to be ironic well that, that that hat is there to keep people guessing does he have a man bun or not hmm. guess we'll never know will we well, dubious dad jokes are over for the day. Oh, no, no, I got one more. I got one more. This is this one is a thing of beauty. We're driving down the road to the hunt, driving down the road to the hunt at the National Park, and um, one of the guys who were with my brother's father-in-law um, looks out, and there's brown and black cattle in the, in the field, and he goes, those are summer cattle. And Reagan and I turn around, and like almost like lemmings, we're like, what are summer cattle? And he goes, some are brown and some are black. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That Seriously. Played right into the hat. Seriously. Yeah, I'll be repeating that one. <laughs> did, did your dad? Uh, to, that's, you, you were hunting with your dad. You didn't pick up any jokes while you were hunting with him? No, he doesn't do jokes. Okay. No. So when we've said in the past that the reason we do these awful jokes on our podcast is in honor of our fathers, that was a lie? <laughs> well, I never said that because <laughs> if you asked my dad to tell you a joke, his reflexive response would be, I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, boys, I think we've... Well, uh, uh, I think we have pretty, we, we've, we've pretty much tapped this one. <laughs> I think. Unless anybody has anything more. So this is number 11. I think we've got to pull off another 12 or the 12th one this week because next week I'm going out of the country. Where are you headed? I'm going to Finland. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go either, probably not rape, but maybe pillage your countryman dinger and see if we can get some mustache uh, growth back in the gene pool. <laughs> Gross. Are, what are you hunting in Finland? Are you hunting moose? Are you hunting those giant grouse? What are you hunting? I am hunting moose. All right. Awesome. And I've got to decide. So I'm. I'm there as a guest of. Uh, Sako, but I now understand that they call it Seiko, which I've deliberately not called the gun company Seiko because we have a town just west of Glasgow called Seiko. And loath would I be to mispronounce the name of a town or a gun company. So i got to figure that out. That makes one of us. Well, I, I want you to know that I've got a list where I've written down all of the possible ways that I could mispronounce your hometown Andrew, and I'm I'm two thirds of the way through it, and so when I get to the bottom, I'll start over. That can't wait. Can't. There's your reason to tune into number twelve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, until next time, stay on gravel. Enjoy this bonus track of Bronson attempting an intro. All right, Bronson, lay the intro on us. This week on Gravel, you'll hear, and this is a direct quote, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pretty awesome, it turns out. Which one of us said it? I bet you guys will never guess. And let's see, the Minnesota governor's hunt, Eric Dinger spent some time there, so we got somebody new going on and on about Minnesota other than Bronson, and bragging about the less than 25% success rate for the hunters there. Um, 
Let's see. That wasn't a really good intro, guys, but, you know, it, it's what I like the are. energy. I, I No, I kind of liked it. It had a little pop to it. <laughs> well, here we go. <laughs> Marty's going to use this. <laughs> and he's going to be so pissed. <laughs> so are we going to... Are we giving Marty producer credits? Is it official? Okay. Sure. Oh, yeah. You want to try that again, or you just want Marty to run with that one? Oh, let's, let, me, let me try a different one. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, this week on Gravel, we've got something new for you. Sometime in this episode, someone is going to make this quote, I'm pretty awesome, it turns out. You need to guess and bet with your buddies which one of his... Of which one of us it is, and then, well, we don't have any way of knowing what you guessed, and we can't give you a prize. But you know, it's it's way it's a way for you to be engaged at home and playing along in the home game. Okay, I didn't get there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to pull the plug at any minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe, Andrew, maybe you should just record the train wrecking outside of your hometown of Glass Cow. Glass Cow? Oh, Glass if, I start, cow. if I start mispronouncing it, I got a whole bunch of new ones. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think you have to say something about the fact that I'm pretty awesome and uh, a state park masturbator in the same sense. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, silence, please. Three, three, two. This week on Gravel, we've got one member of our group that has made a couple of quotes. One, and this is a direct quote, I'm pretty awesome, it turns out. And here's the second quote. It kind of looks like a state park masturbator. Which of us said that? I bet you'll be surprised. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh...